welcome students and teachers to our 17th summer fall segment of the Constitution and American Life with, wait for it, the Friends of Publius. Yes, you heard right. For a myriad of reasons, we have decided to change the band's name. Now, we were gripped in intense debate for a number of days over where we wanted to go with the name of the group here. We went from Brutus's Brutes to Chartered Paramecium, and we decided to settle on the Friends of Publius, which is what we were most comfortable with. But I want you to know, although we respect Publius, there, the, our name no way expresses 100% agreement and support for the ideas espoused by Publius and the Federalist Papers. In fact, for those who have followed us for, in our, our previous discussions, I believe you are all too aware of the tendency at times for one or more of us to express our frustration with the constitutional arrangements advocated by Publius. But that's what makes this all very fun for the group here and hopefully for you. On a side note, we would like to encourage both students and teachers who view this program to let their friends and colleagues who are involved in the teaching and learning of government and civics to share a word about the Constitution and American life. Although we focus our discussions on the questions posed to students who are participating in the We the People, the Citizen, the Constitution program, it is our fundamental belief that all students of America's Constitution, from general to AP government and civics, to college classes around America, that they can benefit from these discussions. So let's move on. Today's discussion focuses on the due process of law, due process of law and more specifically, the right of trial by jury. Students are asked to respond to the following quote from an old wig three. I don't know what the three stands for, but we, fortunately we have Professor Moore here uh, to maybe enlighten us on that. The quote reads as, we ought not to part with the trial by jury. We ought to guard this and many other privileges by a bill of rights which cannot be invaded. Now, you would think that trial by jury would not be controversial. I believe it is somewhat common sense to see the value of the right. Americans today value the many positive vir uh, virtues of our jury system. The jury helps to sustain democratic values. The jury is a key part of our due process protections guaranteed in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. The jury is the guardian of the public trust and the voice of the community values inside a legal system dominated by lawyers and judges. Yet we also hear many criticisms about juries in practice. Juries are biased. Juries disregard the judge's instructions or the law itself when reaching a verdict. Juries know too much about the case for media publicity to be able to render a fair judgment or juries know too little and are unable to comprehend the issues in complex cases. Finally, too many Americans shrink from their civic duty by seeking to avoid jury service. And to put this in context, if there's, there, there's no richer time to talk about this than right now. We've had two major cases just in the last you know, weeks one was in Man or it was it was in uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin, and that jury, and one is in Georgia, and that jury, and in fact, in in that case, the question of race and jury is very much uh, at the forefront of the discussion of a fair uh, trial. So let's begin our discussion. We're going to start today with uh, Professor uh, Kavanaugh, and Chris. What I'd like you to do is kind of lay a foundation, if you could and provide a definition, because one of the tasks we have today is to talk about due process of law. What, how do you define due process of law and what are its origins? Well, I'll start with the second part first, Dave, and I think uh, most of we, the people students will know, and I think the book does a good job of talking, taking it back to Magna Carta 1215. I believe it's um, Article 39 of Magna Carta. I'm pretty sure that the text talks about this and uh, I'm just going to read for, uh, the quote is uh, uh, um, proceeding against Freeman unless by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. 
So that really is the beginning of what we would um, call due process. But it's interesting because, in, in, and Tim can help me out with this, but as I understand it, um, that is parliament has that ability. But in our country, those statutes and laws passed by our governments are at the scrutiny of the courts, where that necessarily did not uh, come into play too much in England. So, but I, 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 my simple definition of due process is procedural due process, procedural due process, amendments four through eight, let me, and 14, let me make sure that's clear for the students as we're dealing with, not substantive due process. But from the minute the police pull you over to the minute you walk out of court a free person, or you don't, there are steps that the government must follow to make sure the, this procedural due process, they must follow to make sure you're treated fairly under the law. Um, that's pretty much it. Well, I, I want to check because you seem to emphasize procedural, which implies there's another notion of due process. And if so, what is that other notion of due process? Oh my gosh, this is a uh, use Tim. <laughs> Do you and, 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 yeah, we're, we may hopefully we'll get it, but just if we can clarify. Well, this is, uh, well, this is a substantive due process. You know, we've talked a little bit about in other episodes about the squishiness, to use our technical term, uh, of the substantive due process. Um, is the is the the law is self fair, um, and we're not. I don't. I don't think we're going to go down that rabbit hole for this discussion. So we are talking about procedural due process. Thank goodness we're talking about procedural due process. Okay, and you also mentioned, you know, uh, th within the Bill of Rights, I I'm just curious, and I, I know I'm going to reveal my ignorance, but aren't the rights in, in, in the Constitution itself, aren't they procedural? How would you define the rights like well, habeas corpus, Bill of Attainder, and things like that? Are they the, procedural? Um, yes, they are. They are, okay. sure. Um, and I would also include that, I mean, because we know the right to trial by jury uh, is included in Article Three. It's a protection. It's one of the individual rights in, in the body of the Constitution. And uh, Jack Rakoff, R A K O V E, a constitutional scholar of some merit, <laughs> I'm saying that facetiously, of great merit, um, said that really the two most important rights the the, colon the colonists got from Magna Carta was the right to uh, be taxed with your consent. You cannot be taxed without your consent, and the right to trial by jury. In the vicinity, and the old English word is vicinage, right? V I C I N A G E, in the vicinity where the crime was committed. With the alleged well, that's a that's a perfect transition to go to Professor Moore here, um, and I guess I need some clarification. I, I read this quote, Tim, about fourteen times, trying to figure out the context and everything. Uh, so. I'm hoping you can help me clear some things up. Uh, in Article 3, Section 2, as Chris says, there is already a federal guarantee to trial by jury. Since the Bill of Rights was in, in written- in criminal, in criminal cases, criminal right, cases. Right, okay. But I'm assuming that the Bill of Rights, especially you know Amendment 6, is redundant. I mean, that's what it seems like. It's redundant. If we already have a trial by jury in criminal cases against the federal government, and you guys have helped me understand that the Bill of Rights was written to protect us against the federal government. So isn't it redundant to have Amendment 6 along with Article 3, Section 2? It seems redundant. Can you put this all into context for us? Um, well, in part, it is uh, redundant. But, you know, uh, students, if you look at Amendment 6, there's, there's some add-ons. Uh, Yes, there's the there's the restatement about criminal trials. Uh, there's the statement about uh, vicinage, but then there's a few other things that describe what's going to go on, uh, what rights you have, procedural rights that you have that are not listed in the body of the Constitution, uh, Article Three. So, so I would say in part it, it's a restatement, but it goes further and elaborates a few more details of what a trial would cons um, what rights a person is afforded. Uh, in that trial. Well, why, why uh, just help me out, why the redundancy? Um, I, I don't, honestly, I don't know exactly why that is. Um, I think it, it, remember in part, 
Madison is writing the Bill of Rights after the Constitution's ratified, and he has to address a lot of the anti-federalist concerns, uh, um, in frankly, in what the Constitution doesn't say. Um, and so I think I would answer it at a theoretical level that he's he's clearly speaking to anti-federalists that we're going to put some of your gripes that you've uh, that you um, it, you know put forth in eighty seven through um, eighty eight, and we're just going to state those straight up in a bill of rights. Uh, so I'd say he's he's uh, attempting to slake their fears. Uh, there's our word for the week: slake. <laughs> um, their fears, their fears in the first Congress. Well, well this quote, go ahead, Chris. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, David. I think I want to jump in here and absolutely I agree with Tim. There's a redundancy, but I think you have to take the sixth with the fifth and the due process clause, the procedural due process clause within the Fifth Amendment itself, right? right? So the idea is, is that the accused must be given, you got to be given notice of the charge, right? Uh, you've got to be given uh, adequate opportunity to respond to that charge. And there's, I mean, this is a thing that's important about this is the right to be heard. And I'm not sure if the text uses that language, but that includes a right to be heard. So that, I think you take the fifth with the sixth, does it, is it a redundancy? Yeah, but it also makes it the, the, maybe the right more secure or more protected. Well, so I'm assuming back to you, Professor Moore, that this is the beginning, this quote, the context is the beginning of the Federalist and I Federalist debate. Because it's in October of 1787. Yep. yep. All right. So is this part of the orchestrated plan to advocate for a general bill of rights? Is that what the context is of this quote? Um, yeah, that's a and, and that picks up steam too, especially after Massachusetts Convention, where every state afterwards sends along recommendatory amendments. So so yeah, um, I mean, from even Pennsylvania, one of the very first, uh, actually the second <clears throat> to uh, uh, to ratify, uh, they didn't have any recommend, rendu, uh, excuse me, recommendatory amendments. In fact, the Federalists at the convention made sure the anti-Federalist gripes were not entered on the official record. So the anti-Federalists in Pennsylvania literally have to have their suggestions, recommendations uh, about the Constitution and how it should be changed. They have to go outside the convention, and they do so, and their gripes are are put in the newspapers, and it was known as the dissent of the Pennsylvania minority. Uh, so that's interesting. This, the second thing to note about the Pennsylvania minority is that they're in their listing of rights that they're suggesting uh, have many things that do wind up in the Bill of Rights, including their suggestions regarding juries. So I am to, I am to take it, because I'll be honest, and again, I, I'm the least educated here uh, when it comes to this, Old Whig Roman numeral three is an anti federal. Right. Yes. Right. Uh, yes. Now, and it's early too. Re remember, old um, James Wilson rankles a lot of people's sensibilities. Um, and he gives a very early speech um, in Philadelphia. Uh, basically, his argument is uh, in, in many ways, Wilson's first speeches about supporting the constitution are really kind of become the federalist uh, party line in, so, in, in many ways. Now Publius starts writing uh, very quickly as well, but Wilson's arguments early in the debates drive a lot of this. So Whig is, old Whig uh, is responding, and, and there was a series of old Whig essays, and this was the third one. Um, so, so Brian, uh, George Bryan is responding to Wilson's statement in this particular case uh, that don't worry about, um, in fact, Wilson makes this goofy argument that, well, you know, at the convention, we really couldn't guarantee this right uh, in civil trials because the civil laws in all the states are so complicated and they're so uh, all over the map that there's no way we could guarantee that right because the civil law, civil codes in all the states are too complex, so we didn't address it. Well, you know, <laughs> uh, so old Whig is taking Wilson to task, and he's saying, "Look, uh, you know, he, he's playing the bull, the the BS card." Excuse me. Um, I have to kind of keep it clean there. So he's saying, <laughs> "Look, um, the Constitution's silent on this," and he does something interesting. And other anti-federalists do this too. They say, "Look, 
with the supremacy clause, this is a dangerous constitution because the supremacy clause uh, would mean the federal judiciary could obliterate uh, criminal code or alter criminal code. So, um, so old Whig is really taking Wilson to task in some of Wilson's arguments about the Constitution being great when it comes to protecting jury trials. And the anti-federalists are saying, yeah, only half of the equation, criminal. What about civil? Well, I, I got to, I'm sorry, but I got to <laughs> ask this because we've talked about this numerous times about the sincerity of the anti-federalist towards the idea of a Bill of Rights. This seems to come across as sincere, as a sincere interest. Is, well, I mean, you look at, I mean, you, you, you throw in Brutus's essays 11 through 15, and a lot of his critique of the, of the courts is, is spot on in my mind. Uh, and I've been accused of having an, an undue affection for the anti-federalists, but I, I think uh, Brutus uh, is, is right on. I mean, this, okay. so yeah, I, I, but your idea of a bill of rights is interesting because some anti-federalists are using the bill of rights argument and Madison says this to get a second convention. Right. Uh, and undo and undo the whole process. So, yes, there is some disingenuousness on some anti-federalist uh, part, but uh, but others, um, it's a sincere conviction. So, Professor Williams, uh, in my research, this blew my mind. I don't know why it blew my mind, but it blew my mind. Uh, I found it interesting in, in, in doing some of my reading that our mother country, that would be uh, England, uh, which influences so much of our thought on political theory and, and constitutional governance, the jury trials are not guaranteed in, in their country. In fact, only 1%, and it's actually less than 1% of criminal trials in England require a, a jury uh, there. Given that, I'm wondering from you know your studies, is is trial by jury considered a fundamental right in, in most of the democratic republic uh, world, uh, uh, in your opinion? I mean, based upon your studies uh, in comparative government, do, do all countries have some enumerated or common law notion of a trial by jury? No, they don't. It's pretty, it's pretty mixed. I mean, <clears throat> what you just oh. said, I mean, what you just said is like, um, the, it's the common law tradition, right? So that that's a tradition that comes out of England, and then it the the countries that England either colonizes or comes in touch with. That's gonna it, it may be there, but in most in civil law countries, which is a whole different tradition, right? The jury trial just isn't as important. So it's mixed from the beginning because of these two traditions. And then you're right, even in countries that have a common law tradition. Um, the jury trial is not considered as fundamental as it is in the United States. And I, I, don't, have a, I, I, I don't have a good answer about why that developed the way it, it, it has, but, but you are right that that's, that's what, what's going on. Well, your expertise is South Africa. So, and again, I think it's important that the kids <laughs> understand how different areas of the world. In South Africa, is it enumerated? No, in <laughs> fact, in South, South Africa, um, there was a right to trial by jury until 1969. And in 1969, that right was abolished. Um, the, the, <laughs> the reasons for that are, are mixed, but it's, it's, um, it was definitely to give, you know, the, the courts and the law played a huge role in the oppression of black South Africans. Um, the, the courts were used, but they were used in a way where they wanted to get particular outcomes, right? So having a jury system would open it up to, um, Blacks, of course, weren't going to be allowed to serve on juries. They never were. But you could get some white South Africans who might have a little more what we might call progressive or liberal understanding of the law. And I don't think the South African political system wanted to roll the dice with that at all. So they just abolished it in 1969. And in the new constitution, it, it was not adopted. So I, I want this is to all three of you uh, to, to take a shot at, uh, and I'll, I'll continue with Professor Williams here. So given that international perspective, yeah. why do you think, at least in our own minds and in, in, in enumerated, you know, uh, 
constant. Why is this considered so fundamental in our country? Yeah. Why, why, why does America put so much emphasis on this? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think students should think about this question, both in terms of the theory, what I'll share is like some reasons why, but then we should also talk about like how juries actually operate in practice. Because a lot of this, <laughs> a lot of how they operate goes against these sort of explanations. But I think it's, I think the reasons it's so important is that, you know, the purpose of our government, as we've talked about, is to protect us from tyranny and to protect individual rights. So a criminal, uh, the, when the government charges you with a crime of which they could take away your liberty, like put you in prison, that is like the, the biggest power we fear of government from the beginnings, right? So to me, it makes sense that for that, for the government to do something that drastic, <clears throat> that we really want to have other actors rather than just the government making those decisions. We want citizens, right? And I think this is a wonderful example of how our, our classical Republican and our natural rights philosophy kind of come together. Because the notion, again, this is in theory, that you would have virtuous citizens coming together, applying law um, for a member in their community to come back to Chris's point. This is all very community-based, right? It's, you, you have that right to try by, by jury of people from your community. Um, and it seems to align very well with the story we tell ourselves about who we are and how we govern ourselves. And it's one of the few examples of, of a form of direct democracy in our system that I think it's, um, I think most Americans complain about jury duty, right? But at the same time, most people I talk to who have been through jury duty find it one of the most transformational, educational, important experiences in their civic life. So I think for some of those reasons, in theory is why it's important. Well, the word peer, I think, is to your point too, uh, Mike, a uh, jury of your peers, uh, that uh, the idea of peer, your community peers, I think reinforces that as well. I, I would say that there, uh, to your question, David, there's two important things to think about. I mean, we have a lot of uh, I'm going to use the word mythology, and that might be a little uh, cynical, but we do have a lot of uh, beliefs about our founding period. And I think juries fit, you know, uh, we, we uh, I mean, Gary Wills says that we overestimate the role of militia, but that's a powerful image out of the revolution. So we have a lot of powerful imagery out of the revolution, and jury's one of them. I mean, with the fact that the Stamp Act uh, really gives a shot in the arm to uh, admiralty courts. The fact that one, one of the, you know, and you fast forward to um, 74, 1774, uh, the Administration of Justice Act, one of the four intolerable acts, it basically continues that, uh, that trend away from local juries in the colony. So I, I, I would suggest that there's a powerful narrative coming out of the revolution that makes us really want a deep commitment to juries and Stamp Act and the Admiral and the uh, Administration of Justice Act, I think, are, are, are great examples of that, uh, that, that power of that narrative. I'm going to, to dovetail on with what Tim said for the students watching. The Admiralty Courts were used by the British to take suspected smugglers and either to sail them up to Nova Scotia or back to England to stand trial because they were not getting convictions in local courts because no one wants to you know, convict their cousin, you know, or their friend or the person is bringing goods in a little cheaper. So when now you're taking away, you're taking people away from the vicinity or the vicinage where the crime was committed and you're sailing them up to Nova Scotia or England, which makes their ability to put on a defense impossible, virtually impossible, that flies in the face of what the colonists believed they had the rights of Englishmen back to Magna Carta. And I've got a quote here I'm going to read from, uh, our boy Alexis de Tocqueville, um, and I think it really speaks to it. Um, he says, by obliging men to turn their attention to other affairs than their own, than their own, it rubs off that private selfishness, which is the rust of society. You know, that's from Democracy in America, which I think is, I mean, obviously, 
you know, he's looking at, at from the lens of a, a young Frenchman. But I think that's pretty interesting turn of phrase, the rust of society. And it is. But I'm going to go back to Mike's point. It's almost we, we, we do this in our country. It's almost oxymoronic that we mythologize something like I'm going to use that because I agree with Tim. We mythologize this right to trial by jury, but nobody wants to serve on a jury. Everybody does everything they could can to get out of it. What's the old saying that would you put your would you put your fate in the hands of 12 people that were not smart enough to get out of jury duty? And I think we do the same thing with the right to vote. We talk about this right to vote and it's like sacred and, you know, all the stuff we do to now allegedly, allegedly protect it. And yet our, look at our voter turnout percentages. It's, they're pitiful. So it's this oxymoronic, these things we like to put on pedestals and think that we're all that in a bag of chips, but we really don't, we really don't back it up. I'm, I'm also struck, I'm struck uh, in Chris's comments, uh, there was a, a lot of anti-federalists who really went after this appellate jurisdiction. And their argument was that on appeal um, in the federal courts, you could actually overturn, you know, this idea of the mythologizing, mythologizing the virtues of a local jury, that in appeals, you're removing uh, local juries, you know, uh, verdicts. And uh, so there was a powerful, it's a powerful ethos, I think, coming out of the revolution. Local juries, um, we almost were viewed as sacrosanct. Well, I, I just I want to add something. Would it be accurate to say that that our 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 belief in the value and power of trial by jury is also consistent with our political theory of checks? I mean, is juries just another way of checks on power? Public trials, yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and so speedy, we're... and speedy too. I mean, uh, that that's the whole Tower of London thing, you know, coming out of being just just rotting in jail. So I think speedy is it is to your point as well, David. Well, and I uh, Mike opened up this avenue, and I'm of course going to walk through it. I'm <laughs> curious about each of you. Have, have, have all of you served on a jury, and and was it transformative, as Mike said? I never um, make it out of Wadir. I, I was once called and I thought I was in the pool for a, a, actually a federal court in Indianapolis and I didn't, I didn't get the follow-up call and I was so disappointed. So no, I mean, I, I'm, I'm like, this is like uh, kind of a bucket list thing for me. I've never been on a jury. Yeah, no, I haven't either. I've never gotten it out of the first, the first round of questioning. And, and students, <laughs> so what's the I, question that knocks you out? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Do you and, know no, anything I, about the Constitution? That's the question that gets me. Well, and I, well, I hey, think... Can I, hey, Dave, can I say something real quickly and interject? Of course, first? yes. Which I think is, and I learned this, and I think this is fascinating because we're kind of joking about jury duty. But if you go back to the early colonial days, um, they people that served on juries, um, if you knew the defendant and you knew the people that were testifying, that was a good thing. That didn't exclude you from the jury. Because the idea was you understood the veracity, right? So when, when Mike Williams is called to the stand to testify on behalf of Tim Moore, we know that Mike Williams has never told the truth in a day in his life. Right? <laughs> and so you're, you're in the jury and you know I'm Mike. I'm screwed. I'm so screwed. <laughs> Especially about Tim Moore. I've never told the truth about him. <laughs> well, for the students, before we get too, too silly here, this is really strange in how that's, that's changed and that's the, the metamorphosis of that. Where now, I mean, if you know, do you know the defendant? Uh, yes, I do. Well, you're out, right? Or do you know knowledge of this? You do, you're out. But in colonial times, that knowledge actually was uh, uh, made you a better juror because you understood the veracity of the truthfulness uh, of the witnesses and the accused. And and that's a good point, Chris. I found out today in my in my reading that that's more that's kind of a 20th century notion, uh, at least in England. They didn't eliminate people in that circumstance until the 20th century uh, in England. Uh, so th that that's fascinating. And you know, the second thing that's fascinating is I'm the only one that served on jury. Now, for you know, and again, let's see. Three of us are in our 60s. Uh, then we got the Gen X or whatever it is. That between the four of us, I'm the only one who served on a jury. I was an alternate on another jury, 
kind of outside of the city. I was, it was in a county court uh, outside of Bakersfield uh, there, but, and I was excited. I mean, I, you know, I always defer my jury duty to summertime uh, and I was so excited to be selected. Uh, and then I got chosen as, uh, uh, as the uh, foreman, foreman uh, of the jury. You're Henry Fonda. And, but it was Love such a, men. it was, I mean, I was hated at the end, Tim, because it was such a stupid no brainer case, but I extended it by four hours in the jury room because I wanted to get discussion going. I wanted to talk about due process and stuff. And these people are all looking at me like, the guy is guilty. Let's go. <laughs> so I made his vote like four times and stuff. So I can't say it was transformative for me, Mike. It actually, everybody there looked like, I got to do this. Let's just get out of here. Uh, and I'm assuming that in more major cases, uh, you know, capital cases or whatever, that jurors are more virtuous or whatever, which I've been told about the Kenosha jury, that they were very virtuous people, you know, thinking uh, very deeply about these things. But, well, that's that's very fascinating. Amongst the four of us, <laughs> over 40 years of life uh, of being able to serve on juries that only one of us has served. I had one yes. other... I had one other thought about your about your question of checks, uh, David. Uh, I kind of view jury nullification as a check. I mean, you talk about the ultimate. Uh, we don't trust uh, the law or or our judge or attorneys. I mean, I mean, <laughs> jury nullification. I think is a classic check. Okay, and that's why so you don't. You'll never hear a judge explain to the jury that they have that power to do so. It's the, okay, last so, outpost, it's the last outpost of skeptical citizens. Yep. All right. So help me out because that is that is a consistent topic in, in the literature. But I had a problem with it because can you give me an example of jury nullification? John Peter Zinger. The John Peter well, Zinger. Okay. Thank you. That's a 17th century example. And, and, and that's, that's a good and one. It's, and is there something wrong with that, David? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to the historian, I think we'd like and, to. And it's, a, it's 18th century, but uh, who's quibbling? Um, oh, I'm sorry. I thought, no, really? Is it 18? Uh, yes. Oh, it's 1730s, not 1630s. But I was thinking 1630. I'm, I'm fascinated by in some civil cases where juries will award uh, $1. Now, I mean, <laughs> okay, I think and, that's kind of as close as you can get to over, you know, to, to saying we don't really. Uh, and Tim, you're exactly right. I found dozens of cases in, in civil cases were the yeah. jury, but criminal cases is a whole nother area. I couldn't find any examples of jury nullification yeah. in criminal cases. Does And I'm terrible on the Google thing, doing searches stuff. Uh, so just something to think about. Mike, you wanted to jump in. Well, yeah, I, it's interesting, right? Because I, I was doing a little research today, and I, I think it's prohibition cases. There's quite a few examples of juries simply not applying the law because they thought the laws were dumb. Someone gets caught, you know, was caught with, with alcohol or something. In the, um, with the criminal cases, I don't think it's, I think it's harder to maybe see, like it just as like, like an empirical thing. Like I, I heard today on the news in this uh, Rittenhouse jury trial that the jury instructions were 36 pages long five hours right so this one juror asked to take it home with her to read through it and that's where my understanding is is that you could practice jury nullification but it wouldn't be called that like you could just you, you know you're not gonna you you don't have to come out and tell the judge or tell anyone you just ignored one of the instructions to get to your results um you just have to say what the result is right and then how, how you got to that process is not part of, of, of the test. So I think that that's where it could occur and it's just going to be harder to, to see it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess it does. It's it, that means, you know, when we get to specific examples, because like you said, this idea of nullifications in all the literature that I found, but then it was very hard pressed to find specific examples. 
uh, of that. And you you probably are right that it's more it, it's so subtle, you know, that nobody stands up in court and says, oh, "Screw you, judge! I'm not going to follow your directions," uh, kind of thing. Uh, there. Uh, so I want I want to move away from the adoration of trial by jury and maybe look at the other side. And so at the beginning, Chris, uh, I laid out, you know, the positives and, and <clears throat> challenges of uh, trial by jury. And I, I, I'm wondering just in your view as, as one of the best civics teachers in the country, do you think the positives outweigh the negatives on trial by jury in a contemporary, from a contemporary perspective? Um, you know, I thought about this and a couple, two things, sorry. One is that so few cases today go to jury trial, and I, the students can look up the look up the percentage. I think it's like under ten percent of cases yes, it is. go to under jury trial. So I think like ninety three percent of cases are not decided by a jury trial. And the other thing I think that is most in a contemporary sense is that um, in our adversarial justice system, um, where you are innocent until proven guilty. And I think that, my goodness, um, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't want to go off on a tangent here, but in that system, it is not about finding the truth. It's not about finding the truth. Thank so you. That's why I struggle with it, because it's about the idea the state charges the accused with the crime that they believe that they can get a conviction on. The defense, which is absolutely important, gives a vigorous defense to create doubt in the minds of the jury, right? It is not about finding the truth of the situation. This is why I think the students would really be, behoove you to look into the modern inquisitorial systems that exist in Europe. Not the old Spanish Inquisition, I keep, keep thinking of Monty Python, you know, if it floats, it's a, it's a wood, it's a duck, you know, or that kind of thing. It's you not... Yeah, <laughs> it's not that goofy kind of stuff, right? It is the idea where truth is actually to be determined. And, and it's not Chris, can I check in? And that means that there's this, there's no notion of immunity, right? There's no notion as I refuse to testify kind of stuff. And, right. Because I'm, I'm more familiar with English courts where it's still truth. I mean, truth is the point here, not, you know, not this uh, protection of, well, that's, that's, a, that's right. the thing is in the adversarial justice system, is, truth is not the object. Right. In the modern, the modern inquisitorial systems that are in place in different countries in Europe and Japan and other places around the world, truth is the outcome. And you have a panel of judges or solicitors and you have uh, the pro the, what would be the prosecution team, so to speak. You have the accused with the, his or her attorney and they answer questions. Right. And the prosecution defense puts forward its case. The defense can put forward a defense, but you don't have a lot of witnesses or other things that we think of in the old Perry Mason or modern movie kind of stuff that we have or in the like the, the Kyle Rittenhouse case, uh, which is much more serious. Um, so it is really about finding the truth. And I do think that um, uh, th those systems actually might be better for us. Right. So it's, it's not necessarily the trial by jury. There's other facets is, is like uh, I'm sensing that you struggle with. Well, and, I think and, it goes back well, to the I think in the popular in the popular mind, it does. It doesn't help. It seems to me it doesn't help when we get fascinated with uh, jury consultants. Uh, I mean, it produces a big cynicism, I think. Well, in the in in the popular mind mindset uh, about the juries, I mean, in the old even grand juries, you know, you, you can get a grand jury to indict a ham sandwich, right? Uh, so, so even the grand jury that was supposed to be another check uh, hasn't worked out so well in the popular imagination either. I think, in addition with that, Tim, I absolutely agree. Is uh, you know, the public, when when a case is appealed then to the court because perhaps of shoddy representation or uh the what the, the makeup of the jury or whatever the, yeah. you know, the grounds for appeal is then when those grounds are granted or when that appeal is granted and perhaps the, the supreme court weighs in and then you hear about someone what you know the general public would think oh my gosh the person is guilty of sin but they got released on a technicality you know um uh, yeah. 
the Miranda, the Miranda case may be one of the better examples of that, right? Uh, Miranda v. Arizona about self-incrimination. So when people hear that, they get a little frustrated with the system as well. Mike? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with what Chris's description, but I guess, I guess I'm just, I don't just, I, I disagree a little bit about the normative judgment of it. So I guess I would say this, I'm, I am skeptical of an event, any sort of event with multiple actors and things going on of their existing one objective truth that can be found. I'm just skeptical of that. Sure. And I'm skeptical that if we do want to find that, whether a trial where someone's liberty or life is at stake, whether that should be the main goal. So, and again, this is not coming, I, I've never, I, I've never practiced, I've never done a jury trial, but my father was a criminal defense attorney for 40 years. So all, a lot of this is coming from him, right? And it's the point of like, the adversarial process is set up because if we're gonna take away someone's ability to like live in community, that's on the government to prove and the government better make a good argument. And what you want is you want a vigorous argument between the government and the defense counsel. And the truth may or may not come out of that, but what you sacrifice in terms of the truth, you will in theory um, make the best decision about whether this person's life liberty should be taken away. So I would just kind of disagree with what you've set up as the goal of the process itself. I think if the goal of the process is to make sure the government can't put me away unless they do so beyond a re reasonable doubt, then I want biased, I, I want that adversarial process. Um, I think there's another site in our political system maybe where we could be looking for truth. One of the interesting things that uh, I've noticed way back in the day uh, when federal judges would ride circuit and uh, they would have these um, charges to the grand juries. People would come in in the counties or in, within the state. And these charges, I mean, they read almost like uh, sermons, uh, stressing the need for virtue. I mean, they're very, very uh, remarkable. And so uh, I've often thought that, um, I mean, to this point about are we getting virtuous people in, in, the, in the box, uh, so these charge, I, I would maybe uh, suggest that students look up some of these charges to the grand juries because they really, these judges really emphasize this duty. I mean, it's, it's just very much classically Republican, the duty and virtue necessary um, in, on the very front end of, of legal proceedings. I mean, John Jay has, Mike, has some great ones. Sorry, Tim. No, go ahead. I, well, I, I want to, Mike, I don't disagree with you, right, in what you're saying about this adversarial justice system, because we know, I mean, we're going back to amendments four through eight and 14 now. Those are there as, you know, many of them are there as either, and I think Sue Leeson, who's one of the co-authors of the textbook, one of the great scholars in our network, she describes them as uh, shields or swords, right? You know, shield to protect you from the government, sword to, you know, I, I have a right to an attorney, right? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, I, and I think it's, those are important because you are, you, you're lowly citizen. We, we all are lowly citizens and we can only maybe have an attorney that we can afford, right? It doesn't mean you get a good attorney. It just means you have an attorney. <laughs> that's the downside to that, right? But it is there. So, you know, I think that's important to make sure that citizens have so many protections because you are taking on the government that has resources way beyond what we have. Right. So I do think that's important in protection from the, uh, an abusive government, a tyrannical government. But I do think it's unfortunate because I think we, as we're well aware, and we talk about on this program, that there is an, um, there is an unequal justice system as well because it's the best defense that money can buy. And so many people don't have that money to buy that defense. Back to what Tim was talking about, about jury consultants and all the, you know, so if you have deep pockets, do you have a greater chance to be acquitted as opposed to someone who has an overworked, underpaid public defender? Yeah. Yeah. And that was one of the, I guess, you know, branches of possible topics uh, to go to. But I am curious, Professor Williams, given your, subtle and you know uh 
hesitant defense of the adversarial system, but what do you see as the greatest challenge to our system of, of trial by jury today? And in the opening, I had pointed out some categories there. So, you know, on the flip side, what do you see, what, what do you see as the greatest hesitancy you have to, you know, to continue uh, this love affair with trial by jury? Is it, is it simple jury representation as we see in Georgia? I mean, we've got a county in Georgia that's 25% African-American, yet on this, this case, this, this national case of a murder of an unarmed black man by three individuals, there's one black juror, all right? Is that the issue? Is it just simple representation on, on juries? Uh, or is... is uh, as, as Chris has said, uh, is, it, is, is it the simple imbalance of justice? Because for 99%, Chris, I would argue that, that yes, the government has more power, but the 1%, like Purdue Pharma and the Oxycontin situation, Purdue Pharma bought their way out of any sense of justice there because they had the power and the influence. So, I, and I open this to all of you. I picked on Mike first. So, of, of the system, what do you see as the greatest challenge uh, to the system that we have? Yeah, it, it is the two things that you raised. I mean, I think Chris's point, well, that Chris raised first, the unequal sort of um, access to um, getting good counsel, right, is so important. And there's so much, so much good social science literature on how this matters. And then, yeah, I mean, I think we still are um, wrestling with how do we get a community of our, of our so-called peers? And, and I think that it, it, it definitely like delegit delegitimizes the jury system when you have a case like what we see right now in, in Georgia. And I think that, you know, and that's unfortunately sort of, I think, more of the norm and it's it's those would be the two yeah i mean that popped it, up at kenosha too i mean uh the idea that uh, it was one african-american on the jury in the rittenhouse case um so yeah i think the the credibility of juries is uh, is is a definite problem in the future i well, wonder about highly technical cases i mean uh, even really smart people and so, and some of these civil civil um civil cases, how can you keep track of all the data and the uh, like if, patent cases? I mean, how, how in the world can just a regular person keep track of all the tech, um, the expertise that would be needed? Uh, you know, in that case, maybe a judge would be better than a jury of, uh, you know, clods like me in a, in a jury box. Yeah. Well, I, that was one of my complaints too. And another complaint is uh, judges. Um, you know, I, I, I would, make an argument that the prosecution in the Rittenhouse case may have grounds for an appeal simply because of the conduct of the judge. Um, because you see that as, um, I think, being prejudicial in several regards. Can they do that? On the, uh, the grounds for the, the, if the, how, the, how the judge actually handles the case, yes. I but mean, that would, that, uh, help me out because I've heard this discussion He's been found not guilty, so they couldn't retry him. Well, the 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 state, if they chance, if they decide to appeal the decision, but I don't think they will, right? They have to have grounds for an appeal. And you know, could you say by allowing the juror to take home the instructions? Because that you, I mean, Mike, you're the attorney among the four of us. That is really unprecedented, as I understand it. The allow, to allow the, the juror to take and the fact that the juror was not jury was not sequestered from the jump the judge instructed not to refer to the people that were killed as the victims you could call them rioters you could call them looters which actually pre prejudices the jury because there he's allowing those terms to be used without a trial for those people so you're you're allowing the defense to call the people that were killed in Kenosha looters or rioters without actually knowing that's the case. So if the state chooses to, 
could they appeal based upon the, the con conduct of the trial by the judge? And yeah, that's a possibility. Help me out here, because I, I assume that once he was found not guilty, double jeopardy kicks in and he can't be tried again. And the, and the state can't appeal a conviction you know, in the trial, did I miss something? I get, and again, is, I is this one of these where he could be civilly tried? I mean, this is is uh, this well, he can theory. be, but, but but Chris's question is, and, and I agree with you, Chris, because I'm I'm a fundamental believer, Chris, that juries to a certain degree are irrelevant. Having been in, I've been in a number of jury pools. I only I've only been selected once, but the the conduct of the judge seems far more important to me more so than the jury, all right? From the very way that a judge conducts the trial to the judge's instructions. And there were problems in Kenosha with the judge's instructions. If, and I actually, you know, wasted a part of my life watching that trial. Uh, and he was a confused individual on the instructions there, but they still went ahead and the kid was found not guilty. The state can still appeal that? Mm. I, I, I'm, I thought no, they're done. He, they can't appeal. I think you may be right. I'll have to go back and check. I, I'm just, I'm just wondering because yeah, I'd yeah. love it. To get I don't know. I, 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 I think the state can can punish the judge for judicial, you know, problems, but I don't know if they can appeal the conviction or the the the, the not guilty. Mike, I think, I, I think, I think generally that's the case. I do. I do think that don't, don't I mean, at some point, we're gonna to have to come back to these to the Constitution, but states have some latitude with how they kind of draw up their, their um, criminal laws, right? And process yeah. on this. Yeah. So I think generally, you're right, Dave, I think that after I think you're right. I'm gonna to have to check Dave, but I think you may be right. I need to check myself on that. Yeah. Students, we've just revealed a group weakness, and that is the criminal justice system. Which is of, why it's nice to stay in the 18th century. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I'm Peter Zinger. <laughs> yeah, but I, but I, I do want students to understand the role of judges in yeah. all of this. And, and I, I, you know, we, we, we're talking about trial by jury, but the trial by jury doesn't eliminate a judge. And I'm just wondering... Professor Moore, does our system of government federalism have any check on trial judges? Or is it just local government, elections, uh, state bar associations? Is that the only check on judges' power? Yes. Uh, yes to all of those. And I think there's a, a at least in, in Wisconsin, there's always um, a rumble, a rattle and hum <laughs> about judicial ethics, uh, because you will find uh, judges that are in the crosshairs for, for various statements uh, or procedures that they allow or don't allow in their courts. So, I mean, and again, I think the public um, is kind of jaded and down on the whole process in courts when judges, um, you know, <laughs> when there are these accusations and the, and the state bar, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the professional organizations don't take this into account and hold judges accountable uh, for their misdeeds. Well, the last, the last part of the, the question that, still, that the students have to deal with is really about just general due process. All right, so we've moved from trial by jury to now what Chris has called the due process rights. And, and this was kind of mentioned before, and, and this is my fundamental belief. And Madison argued, uh, I think this point, that these due process rights in, in, in the Bill of Rights, they're enumerated and they're all warm and fuzzy and they make us feel better. But in the end, they're parchment barriers. They mean nothing. And I want you students to think about, you know, maybe you haven't been pulled over by a police officer, but one day you will be. All right, the odds are you will be. And what I'd like you to do is I'm sure your teacher's given you pocket constitutions is carry that pocket constitution with you all the time, all right? And uh, uh, yeah, and yeah. <laughs> when when the officer pulls you over and they come to your window, pull out that po 
pocket constitution and show it to them and say, you can't do that because I've got my constitution. It doesn't mean diddly squat is, is my, my personal uh, experience uh, there. Uh, so what do you guys think, of, think about that as far as uh, do these rights and the Bill of Rights really make that much of a difference in our life? Uh, you know, that, I'm talking about the enumerated rights, or is it, as Madison said, it's the structure of government, all right? It's checks and balances, it's representation, uh, it's the myriad of structures that protects us, not these words written on paper. Well, ask, any, ask anybody that's been freed as a, uh, as a function of, um, oh, I forget the name of the organization. The now, Innocence but, Project. The Innocence Project. Ask any one of those people whether those rights uh, in the long term, because in the short term, that uh, in many cases, they didn't have those rights, to your point, David, that they were parchment barriers. So uh, I think without them, we're just kind of stuck with, I mean, we're just stuck with this. Brit the, the British didn't call it due process. They called it law of the land, which is very amorphous, very, very amorphous. It was common law and there was no fixed standard. So Americans changed the phrase to due process. And I think that's an important linguistic move. But I also do think that at least there's a standard. It is not this amorphous law of the land, because in our system, we'd have 50 laws of the land. Uh, so making it due process, I think, is important, and actually listing the content of that, I think, is important and not perfect. Um, I, I, I mean, he called state constitute state bills of rights parchment barriers, and referring to Madison, right, because they were not necessarily enforcing them equally. So that was his complaint: why we did not need a bill of rights, which, of course, we know he does a one eighty on. Um, and I, I, I'm conflicted because the lover of the Constitution, uh, the admirer of James Madison, uh, the teacher of this stuff for a long time, I want to tell kids that these rights absolutely matter. We need to have these enumerated rights to hold a zealous, overzealous government in check. Have we done a good job of it? At times we have, and at many times we haven't, and especially for people of color and especially for women. Think about this. Women being excluded from the jury was not a problem. You could exclude women from the jury and it was not a problem until 1975. So I wanna, I wanna be like, you know, put this stuff on a pedestal and go, yeah, these are really important. This is what really helps define us as a people. We have these protections under the Bill of Rights uh, you know, protects me, the lowly citizen versus the great big bad government, but it really hasn't done a great job for a lot of people. And that's the frustration I have with it. Right. Yeah, I guess I'd, I disagree a little bit if I'm understanding your question right. I, I think, I think these, I think these rights enumerated while not, have not been applied perfectly and have not been applied fairly over time. There's, it's still real. I mean, it's still, it's still that um, <laughs> lawyers and judges play, have to play by these rules. Like you have a right to um, a speedy trial and, and that, that is actually enforceable, right? It, it's more than just a parchment bear. We don't, we don't have a situation like many countries in the world where you can literally get locked up and, and and never really, even, really, you're going to make that argument I, I, in the I, context I, of American criminal justice today? Come on, Mike. I, I think that again, it's not applied fairly, um, but it still matters. And I think for most citizens, their interaction with government isn't with the separation of powers. It's with a police officer. It's with getting a ticket. It's it's going to court. It's I think that's where we interact with government, and I don't see how you can't see that these rules are not meaningful. Like, I I guess I I guess I may be misunderstanding or just really. No, you're not. You're not misunderstanding. Uh, I think you and I may disagree on this. I, I don't think. 
I, I just, again, in my personal experience, the words on paper mean nothing without a vibrant structure behind it. And so many people, I think, put so much emphasis, and this is how we started our conversation. They put so much emphasis on the words on paper, not understanding that unless those words are internalized and they're built within the structure of government, and we all know that the structure of government is itself failed, the, the amount of injustice, and all we have to do is look at the Innocence Project, right? If, you, if you've read and studied the Innocence Project that deals with those on death row, you know, I don't know how many hundreds we're into now. Yeah. But they had to have some, they had to have some, something to hang their hat on. They had to have some standard. Was it justice delayed? Yes. But they still had to articulate that this piece of due process was not followed. Um, you know, I, I guess it's a batting average analogy in many ways. How much, uh, I mean, what's a good hitter? Yeah. I mean, what, what, what percentage on due process um, do we accept as good? Uh, and that's a sliding scale, I think, for many people. And to Chris's point, uh, for various people. So I still think the standards matter and they do in very real ways, even if it's delayed. And, and those are those are horrific. And that book, Just Mercy, was a wonderful book. Uh, and it just broke your heart at how long it takes. But there were real standards involved in those in those cases. There were real due process things that came to fore. I think of the, uh, the news recently of the uh two men exonerated for the murder of Malcolm X, yeah. as we're finding right. out, you know, so yeah, were they, were they, I don't want to say railroaded. It seems like the FBI perhaps, uh, I don't know enough details, but I don't want to, maybe the FBI sat on evidence or knew more than what they let on, but you know, so it's taken a long time. Um, do we live in a perfect system? No, but you know, Magna Carta in 1215, it only protected the nobles. But it plants a seed. The Constitution, when it's ratified, we know it only it, it plants a seed. It only protects white male property owners. It plants a seed. The Bill of Rights, over a process of time and time and time and time, slowly, is encompassing more people within our country. So we have, as Tim said, we have to have these standards. And yeah, it's been far from perfect, but they do matter. Mike, yeah, I just want to, uh, yeah, thank you. I feel like. Um, Chris and Tim are bailing me out a little bit, which is good. They're making the argument I was oh, wanting to make. Yeah, we had a chance to beat up on Dave a little bit. Um, so. <laughs> you know, I, I, just, I just think that for me, it comes back to Chris's point, right? You think about who has the resources to access the lawyers who know how to utilize the system to protect your rights. That, that to me is like, that's the fundamental major injustice within the system. Because I, okay. think, I think we would agree that um, if you are a woman or a person of color, but you have access to the resources to get yourself a top-notch attorney, the, the chances are the system is going to work for you in the way it was intended to, right? But if you are a person without those means, and I would argue, while I think it disproportionately affects communities of color. I don't think that white communities, um, white communities feel this as well, right? That if you don't have the access, if you're a white individual um, living in my community right now, and your landlord gives you an eviction notice in a way that didn't follow the process, and you have no resources, or you don't know to go to legal aid, you're going to be just as poorly affected by that misjustice because of your lack of resources, whether you're white, black, or brown. So I do think it disproportionately affects communities of colors because we all know how that lines up in terms of access to resources and communities of color. But I do think that that is so fundamental, which is why there are big movements here locally and throughout the state, right? Of just more, um, more good lawyers being out there for people to access, because we know that that is a fundamental way that we can address social justice issues, but you have to have access to those lawyers. That is very uh, well said. And I, I want to 
point out to uh, students, uh, I lost my spot here uh, somewhere. Oh, there we are. Uh, you'll notice that we kind of punted on the, the third part of the question that uh, has been proposed to you. And, and I'm going to tell you, it's, it's the type of question that uh, some of us here in this group really don't like, and that is rankings. Uh, ranking uh, uh, importance of constitutional provisions. Uh, and kids are asked to, you know, rank due process, procedural due process rights, which are uh, the most important. Well, I guess if I'm in a Fifth Amendment situation, I like the Fifth Amendment. If I'm in a Sixth Amendment situation, I, you know, so I, I don't know, gentlemen, you know, in our last minute or so, clarify if, if I'm wrong, uh, You're wrong about this. I'm wrong? Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. Clarify you, for it me. It doesn't ask the kids to rank. It asks them to make good arguments about which ones they believe are important. Okay. So potato, which one potato, is potato, potato, potato. Which, no. which ones are unimportant, Professor Kavanaugh? Well, I would say I would actually wonder about the jury trial since so few are actually since <laughs> yeah. so few are actually go to jury trial. <laughs> Wait, we're at the end of the program, and that's what you have to say when I was trying to get you guys to say that the entire hour. Well, I, 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 we... I pointed that out earlier. No, I'm, I'm I'm being facetious here, but I think the idea is is like good teams, and for students watching this. This is how you answer this. You say, this is important, this is important. Then you come in with that statement. Actually, they're all important, right? So I think the good teams will do that. But again, it's asking them to make an argument and pick which one. So defend it, right? I don't know if it's potato or potatoes. It is potato or potatoes. Okay. If you're, sitting, if you're sitting on death row, then suddenly the Eighth Amendment is the most important. Well, not if you didn't have a good attorney. All right, Tim and Mike, you want to close us out with any insights? I'll, I'll go real quick. I, it might be, I might, because of the evolving standard of decency, it may be the Eighth Amendment going forward. It may be that, that we, we continually are uh, destined to revisit what that meaning of cruel and unusual means. Uh, and so, so, I mean, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but it's possible. And then I, I might would, I'd go back in the old days and say habeas corpus, which isn't even in the Bill of Rights. Um, that those would be my two uh, off the cuff thoughts on that. Professor Williams. Yeah, I'm going to agree with Professor Moore. I was going to talk. I was going to say habeas corpus, and I know we haven't taken a lot of time to talk about it, but it's a Latin phrase, students. It literally means you must show the body, right? So it's this idea that you shouldn't in a democratic republic society be able to lock people up and never and never uh, give them the opportunity to hear to hear the charges against them <laughs> and um and if you students if you go to law school i was lucky enough to take um I, i've forgotten all of it but i took two full classes just on habeas corpus i mean this is its own amazing fascinating uh, body of law that changes has changed so much the last 100 years so i'd agree with that and I will make two very quick closing statements. Uh, so I'll play Chris's game, and I'm going to say the right to bail because uh, cash bail, as it's set up in most of this country, uh, heavily burdens those in the lower social economic classes who spend a hell of a lot more time in jail because they don't have, as Mike had said, the uh, access to uh, uh, resources and assets to get out so they spend a lot more time in jail even before their trial even though they're innocent until presumed guilty or uh, presumed innocent until guilt proven guilty california tried to deal with this by getting rid of cash bail but unfortunately we've kind of lost that battle uh there uh and uh uh and also i'd like to refer you we have a previous uh, episode uh some months ago on habeas corpus just on habeas corpus that you might want to look at uh, and, and watch uh, here and uh, uh, those of you dealing with uh, due process. As always, this has been fascinating, especially with uh, four non-criminal justice people to talk about the trial <laughs> by jury. Uh, and uh, as you noticed a couple times, it was a stretch, but I know we gave you some insights and some things to think about. Uh, the next segment will be our last segment of uh, this session of uh, the friends of uh, Publius. 
uh, here, and it's going to be on foreign policy. We will be having a guest with us uh, next uh, session, so we hope that you will uh, uh, join us. Until then, take care of yourself. Peace, love, yerba tacos. Bye-bye, bye-bye.